Good afternoon and welcome to this online seminar. My name is Pierre Schlosser. I'm the scientific coordinator of the Florence School of Banking and Finance. And it's a real pleasure for me to welcome you to today's online seminar on central counterparty clearing and systemic risk. I'm very glad to welcome our lead speaker of today, Professor Thorsten Koppel from Queen's University in Canada, who woke up early today this morning. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Thorsten, for that too and our commentator Agnieszka Smolenska from the European University Institute and Politica Insight. So, Thorsten and Agnieszka, thank you to both of you for being with us today. I think that it's fair to say that your interventions of today will be of a more introductory nature, while your Florence, School, uh, your Florence School of Banking and Finance course in three weeks from now will go deeper into the matter, but also the Q&A session of the seminar will go deeper in the matter. So many thanks also to my colleague Jan, who has prepared the seminar and is managing our online platform as we speak. Before telling you uh, more about our audience, uh, to each uh, of you, I'd like to inform you first about our school's upcoming activities, as I'm sure that some of those activities would be of interest to you or to your colleagues. Uh, you will know by now that the Florence School of Banking and Finance, FBF in short, is a non-national training platform which is part of the European University Institute. The European University Institute is a very distinctive place. It is a public intergovernmental research and education institute which boasts an international community of more than 60 nationalities and offers doctoral, postdoctoral and executive education programs in economics, law, political science, and history. Our school, the Florence School of Banking and Finance, is a recent program of the EUI. It has a diversity of policy debate and training activities, meaning that our online seminars are only one of the many activities that we run. For example, last week, on the 25th of April, we held our annual conference on the European financial infrastructure in the face of new challenges which looked at extraterritorial sanctions relating to the payment system, debt restructuring, and the creation of a European safe asset. The ebook that every year follows our annual conference will be out during the summer, so stay tuned. On the training side of things, our school has been tra training more than 2,200 participants coming from 68 countries so far and a variety of organization backgrounds uh, since its creation. In that regard over the next months we will be hosting several residential courses including Torsen's course on FMI and CCPs on the 20 to 22nd of May. We'll have also a course on liquidity price discovery and market design with Thierry Foucault from HEC Paris that's on the 3rd to the 5th of June. A course on MIFID 2 MIFIR uh, is still in June mid-June with the mixed faculty of law professors and practitioners and last but but not least, a course on the economics of insurance markets with Ralph Kogen from the University of Chicago's Booth School of Business. That is going to be on the 24 to 26 of June. Um, as always, more details can be found on our website and on social media, including LinkedIn. Right, so I think it's time to thank you for your patience and to introduce you to one another. Since you don't see each other, I'll make, as is usually the case, introductions. You are around 100. 10 participants connected today, following us from almost everywhere in Europe and from several other continents. 43 nationalities are represented. We are very glad to count on several participants from the European Central Bank, from ESMA in Paris, and from the European Commission in Brussels. Uh, but of course, let me welcome all the other participants from the other organization listed and not listed here. In terms of gender, 40% of you are women, 60% are men. You're have about eight years of professional experience on average. This time 54% of you are trained economists, uh, not a big surprise. 25% are lawyers and 11% have a background in business. Lastly, 72% of you have a master's degree, while 20% of you have a PhD and 8% have a bachelor degree. Right, so I think it's time to start and enter the matter. Uh, how will our seminar be organized? Well, uh, Torsten, our lead speaker, will guide us through the topic of today for about 20 minutes. Uh, Torsten's talk will be, by the way, supported and punctuated by three polls, which will appear on your screen for you to fit in. And then Agnieszka will step in for about seven, uh, seven eight minutes. Uh, 
And after that, um, after Torsten and Anieszka's interventions, we'll open up the Q&A session where you guys will have a chance to write your questions or comments in the chat box that will appear at the bottom of your screen. Um, I think I've said everything, so let me stop here, uh, disappear, and leave the floor to Torsten. In case you have any questions, the last thing, in case you have any questions on the course design and what uh, will be discussed in the Florence course, uh, at the end of May, uh, we can park those questions at the very end of the Q&A, uh, if you don't mind. Um, so we have the presentation. Tor, if you could please connect your camera and mic, and in the second step, share them uh, with Perfect. The Thanks, Pierre. Perfect. Uh, good morning, everybody. Or I should um, say a uh, rather good afternoon, because most of you guys are in Europe, it seems like. I saw the uh, list of participants. So as Pierre said, um, I'm going to give a, a, a very basic introduction to central counterparty clearing and will focus especially on systemic risk. I still think that it's going to add a lot of value to uh, people as well that are very familiar with some of the uh, intricacies of central counterparty, uh, counterparty clearing and the topic more general because what I'm trying to do is here give a broad uh, economics driven perspective. So really a bird's eye view of the issues. Um, so um, let's jump right in here. Let's see whether I can move these slides. Uh, I have to go over here. Uh, let me just check. Perfect. Um, I would like to start actually with um, a basic definition because some of you guys might not um, be familiar with central counterparty clearing. So what is clearing? So um, you see on the slide the definition and I will just read it off uh, for the sake of it. Clearing of financial transactions considers what? Considers the management of counterparty risk. So what is counterparty risk? Well, it's the risk that uh, a trading partner in a financial transaction does not make good on his obligations. So in simple terms, uh, your trading partner simply defaults on either the delivery of the security or the payment or in a derivatives contract, it's usually always a particular payment, okay? So what does it mean for the other counterparty of the transaction? What happens in a default? Well, if somebody defaults on you in a transaction, uh, you are exposed to price, or a better term that I like better, actually, is the replacement cost risk. So what does it mean? Well, you lost your trade, uh, especially if it's a derivatives transaction, such as a speculative transaction or a hedge transaction. What you have to do is you have to reestablish this uh, particular transaction. And that might be very costly for you, and that's what's um, uh, referred to as the replacement cost risk. Okay, now the big question here is how do you deal basically with this risk? And there's two options. So uh, the first option is bilateral clearing. So what do I mean by that? Well, um, the counterparties just retain the risk and manage it themselves, okay? Um, now, uh, uh, to the topic of the course, um, central counterparty clearing is the other alternative. And what happens in central counterparty clearing in a nutshell is that there's a transfer of risk. So um, the two parties to the transaction just delegate the management of um, the counterparty risk and transfer it uh, to a third party. So uh, let's look at a particular picture that's on the next slide. Um, so you see uh, this picture, and there's three different nodes here. The red node is, is self-explanatory, CCP, the central counterparty. And there's two other sets of nodes here. The green nodes are Ds that are labeled as dealers, and uh, the blue nodes are labeled as C, clients. Um, if you were imagining this picture without the CCP in it, you can imagine a traditional OTC market where dealers basically transact with each other and with the clients. So clients have uh, needs to hatch, want to speculate in a particular market, they establish a contact with the dealer, establish a, a primary transaction, and then dealers lay off and warehouse this risk among themselves, okay, in further transactions. Now, if um, a, a CCP is part of this particular process, as in this particular picture, uh, it interposes itself at the center of all the transactions between its members, and the members are usually the dealers, okay? So uh, the CCP uh, becomes the counterparty to every trade. So in uh, jargon, what people are referring to is that means they 
the CCP is novating the trade. What does that mean? Well, the CCP becomes the buyer to every seller and the seller to every buyer. So none of the dealers have a direct exposure with uh, each other anymore. It basically only has an exposure with the CCP in terms of counterparty risk. Okay. Now, what's the economics of that? Well, the economics is that all the risk uh, is basically transferred, the counterparty risk, to the CCP, and hence the risk is also pooled. And the big uh, advantage what people believed early on when uh, CCPs were discussed as a uh, infrastructure in especially derivatives markets was to solve what is called contagion. And a lot of people equate contagion risk, the risk that one default uh, percolates through the financial system and affects other transactions as systemic risk. Okay, so that's part of uh, the title of today's presentation. So it refers to uh, contagion and the systemic risk, and central counterparties are especially set up as uh, basically a circuit breaker by assuming all this um, uh, counterparty risk and avoid contagion, hence systemic risk in the market. Okay. So let me give you an overview of how we, how we got uh, where we are today. Okay. By the way, uh, the first um, poll was just put up here and you see uh, a particular uh, question here which asks you whether CCPs decrease or increase systemic risks, okay? And it's kind of an interesting question because um, uh, it will set up a little bit what I'm going to say later in this particular talk. So, so please uh, per uh, participate in the poll and answer it. Um, how did we get uh, where we are today? So it's a little bit of a timeline and overview. Uh, the first uh, modern clearinghouses that actually operated as CCPs were set up uh, at uh, right around 1900, a little bit before that. If you will look at London Clearing House, uh, the Chicago Board of Trade, they were set up uh, in the 1880s, 1890s. Uh, the idea of a clearing house, to a certain degree, a CCP predates that actually. The first ones were set up in Japan in the, in the 17th, 18th century. So they go back, the idea goes back a long time. Okay. Now, um, over time, they involved, and in the 2000s, when I actually joined the ECB, when I, I finished my uh, PhD, I worked first at the ECB, there was a particular trend going on in financial market infrastructure with settlement system, but also with clearance uh, system, that there was a lot of consolidation, especially in Europe, going on through mergers, and it's clear why that actually uh, happened. Um, we saw the further integration of the European Union, the single financial uh, markets that uh, were generated, and there was a need basically to establish a common financial market, and uh, partly there was a lot of talk about consolidating through mergers. During that time, we started to work also on central counterparty clearing, which actually is quite interesting and predates the financial crisis. In 2007 2008, um, there were um, the financial crisis hit, and uh, it was actually quite interesting that financial market infrastructure, to a certain degree, functions very well. And that led then to a response, in uh, a formal response by the G20 in 2009 in the Pittsburgh summit, uh, where it was discussed and actually agreed upon that uh, OTC derivatives should be mandatory cleared to add another level of risk management within the financial system. Okay? Good. I'll leave it at that, uh, at that point. Um, of course, that set up a whole slew of events in the European context um, to implement basically this particular mandatory mandate for clearing of OTC derivatives. And so um, in 2010, the uh, ESRB, the European Systemic Risk Board, was established, and then uh, a particular European regulator, ESMA, was established as part of the European system of uh, financial supervisors. And the regulatory framework was established through EMIR, and that still it came into effect in, in 2012, and it's still ongoing. Um, and uh, currently, there's basically a discussion to extend it, and I think right now we are talking about the recovery and resolution framework. Uh, and Agnieszka, uh, later on in her comments, will talk more about that. Um, so let's go over to the next slide. Um, so what I'm going to now is in the next two three slides I want to actually go back to the poll I asked you whether CCPs decrease or increase systemic risk in the financial market and you can imagine because 
I post it like this, that uh, this is a two-edged sword in a sense. So there is no right answer. Uh, to a certain degree, they will decrease. To a certain degree, they will increase uh, risk in financial markets. So um, I have this line here on this slide, great intentions. CCPs were sold, and they're still sold, really, as what I label the marginal line of the financial system. We all happen what happened. Uh, we, we know what happened with the marginal line, so it's actually a good uh, example. So let me start off very simple. Why do CCPs reduce system? Well, first, the idea is they offer services, and uh, the services are linked to multilateral netting. You basically compress your trades, you unravel certain trades because one dealer deals with one trade, doesn't other trades, they're partially offsetting, multilateral netting, hence can basically reduce exposures in a particular financial market, and through netting also solves contagion. Of course, innovation, the circuit breaker, also adds to that and, and, and solves and reduces contagion in the market. Um, a second advantage, which I think is very, very important, which is usually on the plate, is CCPs often function as warehouses of risk. So what do I mean by warehouses of risk? Um, well, uh, they have a lot of information. Through innovation, um, they uh, get a, a, a bird's eye view, a, a good overview over the exposure in the financial market. And hence, uh, they have all the information available to uh, assess risk from a system-wide perspective. Now, the third point here is that innovation, interposing yourself as the buyer, seller to every buyer and seller in the financial market, pools, hence diversifies counterparty risk, but also mutualizes counterparty risks. So um, I don't want to go into details here, but a CCP usually um, also has a, a way of um, um, allocating losses to its members. So there's a particular insurance feature going on here through diversification, but also through mutualizing the risk in the financial market. Okay? Good. Excellent. Now, um, you can dig a little bit deeper. So as an economist, uh, when we talk about policy, when we talk about regulation, you always have to establish what is the market failure. A well-trained economist asks immediately the question, why do we need policy? Why do we need regulation? So, uh, so one has to ask him or herself, what is the market failure? And the idea, and this is kind of what the second part of this uh, slide refers to, is that CCPs impose proper collateral requirements. What do I mean by that? Well, it might not be the case um, that uh, in private transactions in financial markets, uh, the, the, the parties to a transaction have the right incentives to set the right risk management measures and the level of risk management, okay? So in other words, the social and the private costs for setting collateral requirements in these transactions could be different, okay? Um, another uh, layer could be that the capital that's basically uh, pledged in the financial markets for derivative transactions is not enough. So a CCP can come in and from a social perspective, again, implement the proper level of collateral uh, and the proper level of additional resources capital in the financial market. So that's reflected in that CCPs often set what is called a default fund and bring additional capital to the financial market they intermediate uh, in terms of risk management. The third thing is there could be just a coordination failure in the financial market. CCPs uh, could basically help of unwinding losses. And this was very important uh, in the case of uh, the financial crisis with Lehman Brothers. Multilateral netting in an emergency turned out to work fairly well. Uh, trade compression was not a problem. The problem was after Lehman default, of, it was re-establishing positions. And there was a lot of discussions and there were some problems later on in derivatives market. So it was not really the losses per se, but re-establishing uh, positions are so linked to the replacement cost rates at the end of the day, because it matters if you have to replace a particular exposure, you have to seek for a new counterparty. That was a big problem. And so CCP can actually allocate these losses uh, firsthand. And so that's a big advantage as well to solve this coordination failure. At the end of the day, the basic trade-off, you get a feeling for that is in financial markets with central counterparty gearing is, well, uh, having proper risk management, which is the costs. Uh, so the benefits come from uh, better risk management. The costs come from posting additional collateral. This is the basic trade-off. 
The private incentives for this trade-off might be different from the social incentives, hence the need for regulation and policy. Okay. So um, you see the dots on these line, great in, uh, intentions, but uh, it became relatively clear, and I actually pointed this out right after the um, Pittsburgh summit, that you know, if you mandate central counterparty clearing, might uh, solve one problem of a market failure, but you might uh, actually, I don't want to use unintended consequence here, but you might incur a different problem. And so I pointed out very early on in the discussion that, uh, you know, the move towards central counterparty may just shift the problem. Imagine a world where you have 20 dealers and the warehouse risk and they shuffle it around. So maybe when we introduce central counterparty clearing, you might end up just with like 10, 15 central counterparties that shuffle risk around or concentrate risk. So you see like two pictures there. AIG, AIG was the real problem for me in the financial crisis because there was a huge bailout. And in fact, it looked a little bit like a central counterparty AIG because it was so dominant, so central in a particular market for CDS and then the derivatives market. And it became just too big, but also too important to fail. Okay. So what do I mean by that? You might have just shifted the problem away from dealers, away from big market players into infrastructure, into big central counterparties. And I, I mentioned one here without implications. And so the problem here is that uh, the central counterparty uh, has basically just become the most important risk node in the financial system. Now think about that. There's two dimensions to that. Um, there might be actually quite paradoxically an information loss. Counterparties in the market have a lot of private information about they're dealing with about the market and so forth. So that might be lost. That might be not necessarily available for the central counterpart. On top of that, if you talk about insurance, you always have to bring in adverse incentives. And there's two big layers to that. First of all, there is something which I label, um, you could label it an adverse selection in a sense, because once you have a risk transfer, um, the CCP automatically attracts and concentrates additional risk. So that's already a problem there. So people might make more, uh, take on more risk from clients, dealers, uh, peering members, and shove this risk into the central counter. On top of that, you could have collective moral hazard. People know that individual defaults might uh, might be having been dealt with with the CCP. But if there's a collective problem of too much risk taking, people say like, okay, it is what it is. Central counterparties are too central to fail, too important to fail. So that's not a problem. We're going to be bailed out anyway, in the sense, if we collectively take on risk. Why? Because the central counterparty is too important and too central to fail. Okay, good. Excellent. Um, I think there was supposed to be now a second. Uh, uh, here it is. The second poll is up. Um, what I want to do in the next uh, five, six minutes, and then I'm going to turn it off uh, to uh, Agnieszka um, for some some further comments and for some Q&A later on. What I want to talk about is now um, five big challenges, and they're going to be reflected in this particular poll here, um, what's going on. And I'm just following how it's actually uh, developing, and it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting that right now a forerunner four is the resolution framework that just maybe reflects on what's on people's minds, because that has been discussed uh, already. But um, while the poll is going on, uh, let me walk you through these five challenges, and um, I will talk a lot about these five challenges and the course that's forthcoming in Florence in a few weeks from now. So let me start off with the challenge, first challenge, which is basically market po uh, margin policies. It's, it's basically proper setting of margins and collateral requirements. There are two pictures. The first picture is, uh, I could have made a poll about this. Who is that person? You might have not heard of him, but uh, this is Aina A. Uh, or AS is a Norwegian uh, trader, private person who basically caused a CCP, a big default in the Nordic power market, and uh, almost brought NASDAQ, uh, the clearer for this particular market, to its knees. And this uh, raises two questions, okay? And they are shown in the bullet points next to it. First of all, membership requirements. Aina AS was allowed as a private person to clear, as a direct clearing member. And that raised uh, some issues here. Um, uh, basically, the risk management was not properly implemented because you would, uh, you would 
basically you have an additional layer, require a private person to clear through a financial institution with proper front back office operations, an additional basically oversight or supervision layer should have been in place. The second thing is initial margins. It may clear again that you can think about as much as you want, how to set initial margins. There's always a scenario that you might miss, okay? Or that's too costly to, um, to basically implement. And so there's always a residual risk left open and it will materialize and CCPs can fail. We have historic examples for that and it got close at last time, okay? The second picture, I, I took a graph. You don't see it necessarily very well, but it is from a very nice paper that just has been published uh, by the BIS, by the Bank for International Settlements. And it uh, refers to um, basically the margin policies um, and whether they are procyclical. It shows a picture on Brexit and the left hand side shows how in this particular market environment, Brexit caused basically a spike in, uh, in margin calls. And the left hand, uh, the right hand side picture, you can't see it very well, I apologize for that. Um, shows your graph for the big dealer banks in terms of the high liquid assets and the proportions of these high li liquid assets that are used as margins. And the idea is a big issue here is that margins uh, are designed to be procyclical at the end of the day, but that causes a big problem. And that's a big challenge. And we haven't really find a way around it and how do you think about this in, in broad terms, why? So um, if risk goes up in, in markets, uh, uh, margin should go. That means the participants, the clearing members, have to post more liquid assets, okay? But that causes a problem on the balance sheet. Um, they might have to uh, sell uh, certain illiquid assets, and uh, that could lead to fire sales. They could uh, basically have a reinforcing negative spiral where then they drop out of the derivatives market to make the market and so forth. And that causes basically a cyclical um, movement in terms of margin requirements, which escalate and become higher and higher. And that could be a problem. And again, I think we have talked a lot about this problem, but it's not clear to have a solve. So let's move on to the second challenge. I, I just look at this. Um, I think the biggest one, the front runner with almost 50% was actually the, re the resolution and the um, recovery framework. I want to keep it short. I think there's going to be a lot of questions then that are going to come in. And yes, they're going to comment on that. The question is really, when to let a CCP recover, when to resolve it, and quite importantly, and we haven't talked about this, how and when do we resurrect it, okay? And I have a picture here for the default waterfall. Most of you are familiar with it. Uh, first, the default pay principle comes in. We have the default is initial margin is going to be seized. The capital contributed, so to speak, the default fund uh, contribution uh, for the member is going to be seized. Then the CCP uh, uh, puts up its own resources to a certain degree for that. Then uh, the loss is going to be neutralized by the additional drilling member pay. And, and then there's extra costs coming. And the problem is really with the extra costs. And just to give you a precursor, because I'm going to talk a lot about this in my course later on. So if you if you if you are interested in this really, I think it would be worthwhile joining the course in Florence, because the idea is really that it's very, very hard to think about in from a practical perspective how to resolve and resurrect a CCP. And it's not as easy as you might think, because if a CCP goes under, you have a firestorm in financial markets. And just from a realistic perspective, it's very, very hard to basically deal with the CCP. And there's no other choice if you want to resurrect trading and uh, uh, get trading going again and go back to normal market functioning. Uh, you can't just turn back the clock and go back to buy a direct clearing for a long time. Essentially, you have to come in and resurrect the CCP. And I think there's only tough choices to be made. Okay? And I'm going to talk a little bit later about some ideas I had over the years about that. But I think this is a big uh, problem and uh, Agnieszka will uh, update us a little bit on the thinking on this in terms of Emir and ESMA. Brexit, um, there's going to be lots of uh, questions probably as well. We have actually a special session in our course on that. Maybe you have someone uh, from the Bank of Italy coming in uh, talking a little bit about Brexit and what ESMA's response is going to be and uh, what Emir is uh, um, going to deal with it to a certain degree there as well. 
and we have later on a panel with someone from ESMA as well that we are going to discuss this a little bit further. I think the first discussion, as as far as I have followed it, I think they're going to be a practical solution that we are not shutting out the big CCPs that are quite interestingly all operating out of London, uh, London Clearing House, uh, the London Mercantile Exchange, and Ice Clear. Uh, they're going to be allowed further to clear um, uh, as third country uh, country central counterparties in the EU. I think that's a sensible solution. Of course, there's a slew of practical issues that we have to solve. And I just put three up here, and we can think about more about this in the Q&A, but who will really be the supervisor for CCPs? I mean, uh, we have to work together with, with uh, the UK authorities in the EU and so forth. Um, quite interestingly, it's the discussion is not that different from banking regulation at the end of the day in the EU, for example. Um, what will happen in a member default or a near member default? Um, there's two dimensions to that. Um, why should foreign member pay if, if a problem occurs with a particular uh, uh, institution in a member state? Uh, why should the other member, the, the institutions in other member states pay for that? Uh, there will be a big discussion if that happens. But it's also the other way. Um, suppose a big uh, member should, uh, a small member overall will fail, but it's locally a big member. Why should we bail that person out from a, from a market-wide perspective, it doesn't matter. From a national perspective, it matters a lot. So these are the discussions that will necessarily occur. And, and I, I think we have the same issues in banking regulation and banking resolution. So they are, they are not new challenges. Okay? Um, also, what will happen in a worst case scenario of CCP default, loss sharing arrangement that goes back to my earlier, uh, earlier slide might not be enforceable in the entire industry. And the loss allocation is going to be very dicey because how do you allocate losses across different national entities that are all members of a multinational EU-wide or third country, uh, third country CCP? So there's a, a lot of questions which, which is going to be difficult basically to address. Okay. The next challenge, uh, you just uh, basically uh, see another question here uh, about Brexit um, that pops up. Um, you can participate in this call as well, but let's move on to the last two slides. The last two challenges are important. So challenge capital. People, I think, underestimate the following fact. I put some, I put some numbers up. I don't want to go over that. Um, it just gives you a comparison between measures of exposure. I think cross-market value is, for me, a good uh, measure usually. Cross-credit exposure is just a snapshot in time. Cross-market exposure is better because credit exposure can explode over a short horizon. It puts it into perspective in terms of the capital that's in place to back up these exposures. And you see, um, there's not a lot of capital to back up these exposures. And more and more CCP and more and more transactions are going to be CCP clear. So what's the issue here? Well, the issue here is, at the end of the day, what matters from a market by perspective is the amount of liquid assets in the system, and the amount of capital. And unfortunately, uh, a lot of CCP clearing has to do with reshuffling capital and nothing else. It does not increase tremendously the capital in the system and the liquidity in the system. That's a big problem. I have talked about in other forums over these years, for and over these years, about an idea about systemic risk insurance, which is really systematic risk insurance, which comes out of the idea how to deal with uh, catastrophic losses. It's re really linked to reinsurance and the role of government in reinsurance. And so we can talk a little bit more if you have questions, but the idea is really to think about, to back up the CCP uh, realistically, because you can't tap into member funds in a system by crisis. So what do you do? Well, you think about reinsurance, you build up resource in the market upfront in normal, um, in normal market circumstances, build up uh, resource, extra resource to shore up the CCP, number one. Number two, if these are not uh, enough exposed, what you're going to do is basically have a backstop by the government. We have seen this in other regimes. In Canada, for example, you have mortgage insurance in place. We have run such a scheme. Um, we think it's a very, very good scheme. If anything happens in the housing markets, of course, it comes with a lot of incentive problems. The, 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 you have to get the details right. The devil is in, in the details, so to speak. Uh, but we can, if you have questions, we can address this later in the Q&A. Final thing is financial innovation. Lots of stuff going on. Um, there's new products, more customization, 
There could be more customization might require more collateral, uh, better collateral management. Um, these are all possibilities. Um, ultimately, it asks the question basically how it changes the trade-off between better risk management or appropriate risk management and collateral cost. It will change this trade-off fundamentally. Hello. Thank okay. you very much, Dorsten. So Anieszka is now joining us. Okay. Uh, Anieszka, if you could just connect your camera and share it with the platform. I think now it should now it should be fine. Yeah. Okay. There you are. Very good. Welcome. Okay. Thank you very much, Pierre, and thank you very much, uh, Professor Koppel. Um, hello from Sopot, Poland. Um, Okay, I will be brief and I will just cover a few specific points relating to regulation of CCPs. And uh, this is a very, very timely seminar in that regard because just 10 days ago, a new reform was voted through in the European Parliament of Emir that will come into force towards the end of this year. So um, CCPs are an absolutely fascinating topic to study uh, from the side of EU regulation due to specific challenges that they raise in the EU specific context, uh, namely the institutional aspect, the evolving regulatory framework uh, that Professor Koppel alluded to, and the question of Brexit, which is now omnipresent in financial regulation. Um, so just to introduce these three points briefly, and then I will uh, cover a little bit the main aspects of the um, new regulation, which will then be covered in our training uh, towards the end of May. So on the institutional side, uh, what um, the reason why CCPs are so interesting is that they concern the interplay between the ECB uh, competences of oversight and uh, the other EU institutions. So in 2015, there was a seminal case which concerned specific limits to powers of the ECB over the oversight of uh, CCPs. There, uh, the Court of Justice of the EU denied the ECB the competence to impose specific requirements on uh, CCPs located in the UK. This then spurred a reform um, that was then uh, covered a little bit in EMIR, but this competence aspect and delimiting the competences of ECB as a supervisor is one reason why we study uh, EMIR at the EUI as well as part of a project on, on financial regulation. Secondly, and this is a subject that Professor Koppel alluded to, um, CCPs, um, the new regulatory framework for CCPs put in place um, now needs to be continuously revised because indeed um, as we brought uh, a large number of over-the-counter derivatives to these central feeling platforms um, there the very nature of this business activity changed and therefore we have to um, uh, continuously adapt the regulatory framework this is also something that is rec um, reflected already in the new reform which foresees um, continuous revisions. And finally, the question of Brexit. Um, so as uh, very often, especially central bankers state, a majority or a great part of Euro-denominated uh, derivatives are cleared on uh, central counterparties located in the UK. So this is 95% um, of Euro-denominated interest rates uh, derivatives and 30% of Euro-denominated repos which are uh, cleared in uh, the UK. As a result, um, there is an interest in ensuring that there is adequate EU oversight over these. Mm, how, and um, even if Brexit doesn't happen, this raises a very important question of oversight of, um, multi, of um, CCPs in a multi-currency union. So as a result of these three specific challenges, uh, new EU regulations were are now introduced and voted through. Um, these seek to um, count to address these specific challenges. So improve uh, financial stability of CCPs due to their increased significance, address the Brexit challenges. And here, uh, maybe I already anticipate something that uh, Professor Coppola raised already, um, namely that ESMA has already put in place a no deal scenario. So should a no deal happen, 
uh, the CCPs located in the UK would be automatically um, uh, recognized by EU supervisors. Um, that, thirdly, uh, the new regulations um, are due to the increased role of clearing. So there are quite interesting statistics which um, ex which show us that uh, in 2009, so before EMIR was put in place, 40% of interest rate derivatives were cleared through CCPs. By 2017, this increased uh, twofold to 83%. So we see this increase in systematic risk. And finally, uh, the controversies concerning the role of central banks in CCP oversight. So uh, the, due to their increased systemic uh, relevance, their relevance for payment systems, um, what should be the role of uh, central banks in oversight? Uh, so the reform, which has been um, introduced um, now and voted through in April has four main components. So it establishes a new system of cooperation between CCP supervisors within the EU with the particular role of ESMA uh, in terms of uh, coordinating the uh, cooperation between different uh, authorities, but also it gives ESMA, so the EU agency located in Paris, specific competences uh, to ensure a more convergence uh, between the supervisors in the EU. Um, secondly, and this is already anticipating the possible impact of Brexit, uh, the new EMI regulation introduces a mechanism for supervision of recognized uh, CCPs from uh, third countries. And there, um, an element of proportionality is introduced as well, whereby um, the regulation distinguishes between tier one, so non systemic CCPs. And and tier two systemic super um, systemic uh, CCPs, which are uh, then um, overseen directly by the EU. Uh, thirdly, there is a reform of the internal organization of ESMA with regard to CCPs. So a new CCP supervisory committee is created within uh, the EU agency with specific direct competences. And thirdly, and finally, uh, there is a framework for an increase increased role of central banks uh, within the EMIR framework due to the impact on liquidity or and um, stability of payment systems. However, uh, this reform has also created uh, certain disagreements between, the, as, uh, between EU regulators and uh, central banks. Initially, the reform also included a change in the statute of the ECB conferring additional uh, competences of the on the European Central Bank. However, uh, in the end, uh, this direction was not pursued. Uh, so this was just to outline the four main pillars of the new EMU regulation. In addition, there is also the Recovery and Resolution Directive uh, on which works are ongoing, to which Professor Koppel alluded to as well. We will cover specifically this very new uh, um, framework in uh, towards the end of May in our uh, in our seminar, also together with Veronica Fucile from Banca d'Italia. So uh, now this is to allow us a little bit of time for questions as thank well. Thank you very much, uh, Agnieszka. I look forward thank you very to. much, uh, thank Torsten. You. Um, so, um, time for questions. Uh, Torsten, you, you appeared again. That's great. Um, I, Jan is putting up exactly the results of the polls, which you will have a chance to um, discuss and, and comment. Perhaps we can start with, with that. I invite every uh, participant to formulate their questions and, and start writing and we'll take them sequentially, organize, package them together uh, systematically um, if, there are, if there are too many questions. Before that, um, since you're based in Canada and uh, we like to travel, uh, Carson, could you tell us a bit more how things are in, in, uh, on the Canadian landscape in terms of um, structure, supervision, regulation of, of CCPs? Because, I mean, Europe does things its own way, um, but Canada must do the same. So, how what can we learn also from differences? I mean, I mean, in a, in a sense, the the situation is very different and very similar. So both, in a sense, I mean, we have a very concentrated financial system in Canada. Why? Because we have basically five six big players, uh, which are the five six big banks. But um, Canadian denominated derivative contracts are very small. 
So there's not enough uh, volume there to set up an own CCP. We have CCPs, of course, in the equity market, and we have CCPs actually introduced for the repo market, which is kind of an interesting uh, solution, which uh, I don't want to delve into. But essentially, we face the same problem uh, as maybe the situation of now with Brexit um, um, clearing members and banks in the EU relatively to the location of the CCPs which are in the UK. Because the big uh, Canadian banks like Royal Bank, uh, Bank of Montreal and so forth are clearing members of LCH, are clearing members of LME, of IceClear. So it's not that different in terms of the challenges of supervision because uh, it is a third party CCP. And in a sense, the Bank of Canada as, uh, as, as the regulator for systemic infrastructure has to work together with, um, with the authorities in, in the UK. Uh, and it's just a given. So from a practical perspective, uh, I, I think it's not that different from what the EU is facing right now with Brexit, I think. Okay. Thanks a lot for that. Um, shall we have a look at the results of the polls? I mean, you commented a few already, uh, but if you'd like uh, both of you to just engage with the results, and are you surprised by the results um, of the various polls? So let me just comment on the first one, which is kind of interesting. It might it might be the way when it appeared, but I think it shows that um, still I think the prior is that CCPs are good, and it's true to a certain degree in terms of systemic risk. But it's also interesting that some people already have signed on to this idea they increase systemic risk. And that's actually quite telling for me because uh, I think we have, set, we, set, we have set something up that's designed to be really, so what, when, when are we worried? When things really go wrong in financial markets. And I think on the margin, we saw in, in moderately stressed markets, CCPs are very good. Okay, there's no question, but it really things are getting dicey in financial markets and we have big systemic problems, then I think we have an even bigger problem that we have created. And so CCPs are, I think we should be really worried about them uh, because if there's a really big financial crisis, I think then we face a lot of tough choices with CCPs. Okay, and I think uh, we, we have to think about letting the cat out of the bag here and with the resolution framework, I think we, we just have to be realistic. Uh, a first bank solution, as was discussed with financial market infrastructure in the US, if it were to fail in a big crisis at the start of, the, of, of, of uh, 2000, I think it's just, just an illusion. I, I think if the, if the financial market is on fire, we can't just allocate the losses to these very financial institutions that are fighting for survival. And at the end of the day, it's still the taxpayer that's at, at risk. In, I think we have to go a step further of thinking about how to deal with these uh, critical central infrastructures, not only in, in derivative markets, there's, a, you know, we can think about the positive insurance institution, mortgage insurance and so forth. I think it's a broader discussion that we have to come in and think about, we have to be realistic and we have to think about how do we deal with these catastrophic losses that could occur in the financial system. And I think this discussion hasn't uh, taken place. And I think we have to go beyond the resolution framework. We have to think about resurrection. We have to think about how to deal with this in a broader perspective and, and bring new ideas like systematic risk insurance uh, to the forefront rather than being stuck in you know, the default waterfall and, uh, and thinking about, oh, should we use variation margin haircuts? Should we use cash calls, ca recapitalization from the uh, participants of these institutions, I think, I, I think we are. It's a. It, it creates a, a wrong uh, sense of security. Sorry, I'm talking too much. No, 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 that's fine. And this then brings a little bit. Uh, if I can just, I I will refer to one of the questions. I think this then brings in the question of competition, no, a little bit between, and this is this the discussion that you have in banking, financial stability versus competition uh, question. I'm not sure. There is a question on top. I'm not sure how, uh, Professor Koppel, you would uh, think about this. Yeah, so I, I just see the, um, the first question about competition between CCPs. Um, I'm not sure. So, I mean, I never thought about it like this. Competition between CCPs helped to reduce systemic risk. Because let's stay 
honest what a CCP is. A CCP is a natural monopoly. So if you think about it, usually uh, from a netting perspective, from an efficiency perspective, um, you actually want to have a high concentration of CCP, okay? And competition between CCPs is also tricky because what would, from a social perspective, competition benef benefits from competition, what would it mean? Stricter risk management, possibly, but what are then the incentives of the participants? Would they choose the one CCP that has better risk management in place? Because if it's collective moral hazard, you actually want to say like, well, these can't fail. So if you all go to the one which has less risk controls, cheaper risk controls into place, it's more like a race to the bottom. So I think competition can never be the answer of solving systemic risk, not from an efficiency perspective, not from a, uh, you know, a market participation perspective and a market choice perspective. Okay, thanks. So there are a few more questions coming in. Uh, let's start with Frederick, if you allow me, who asks, uh, to dampen the pro-cyclical effects of CCP margining, regulators consider to use a macroprudential tool of margin seedings. Could this imply that regulators don't allow CCPs to properly account for counterparty credit risk? So, uh, from an economics perspective, this is exactly the trade-off. I, I, I think it's a tough choice, but you gotta, you have to look at the situation. I think there's no problem if there is a uh, default of a single member, and the default is not systematic in the sense that the entire financial system it is, risk, is at risk. I think there's not a problem here in the sense that you would say, like, all right, um, you're going to cease the margin, you're going to increase margins. It's not going to snowball out of, out of uh, proportion. Um, now, if you have a system-wide shock, yes, absolutely. I mean, uh, that just means uh, you have to be sensible about it. If, if uh, there's what we over, always or usually refers to wrong way risk, there's already problems in the financial system. And now you come in and say, like, well, the CCP by itself says, like, I'm fighting for survival. I want to hire high margins because there's too much risk showing up in the market. Well, then you compromise in the financial system. And again, you, you know, at the end of the day, all that matters is the amount of capital backing up the risk. And, you know, we can talk as much as we want about liquidity, feedback cycles, and so forth. If risk materializes, you have only one tough choice. And, you know, the threshold of risk uh, that materializes where we get into trouble depends on the overall capital positioning in the market. And I don't see with the move to CCP that we have increased tremendously capital in the market. So that's the problem, okay? And so, um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tough choice. I think in a systemic uh, problem, I think we have to be very wary how much the CC you can protect the CCP with its early defenses of, uh, of margins, of the default losses, and so forth. We have to be very careful about that, okay? I think that links up to another question. Um, Agnieszka, feel free to, to jump uh, as, as you as we proceed. So George Georg Schmidt was asking, if we consider CCP membership as a public goods game, with the public good being contributions to the default fund, why not taking excessive risk? How can we punish excessive risky excessively risky behavior? Meaning punishment, punishment has been shown to work in the classical PG literature, but I think there are many challenges in this context, says Georg Schmidt. What do you think is possible? I think it connects with what, what you were saying. Uh, so let me just make a quick comment here. So one idea of the systematic risk insurance is exactly to address this idea of, of, of collective moral hazard, of, of this idea of, of taking on additional risk and funneling into the CCP. So the idea is very simple. So what do we know from the public goods literature? We have Picubian taxes. You have taxes that change behavior. Now, this is a very theoretical uh, idea that I propose here, and there's a lot of problems of implementing this. But the idea would be, well, if you have the feeling as a CCP that there's additional risk contribution to the net exposure in the market that is contributed through additional trades, you could have an extra levy on bringing this risk to the market. So beyond your margin contribution that secures the individual transaction, Mm -hmm. You could also uh, basically uh, have a tax, so to speak, on the contribution of this in additional transaction that comes online to the uh, to the overall market risk, and that would be an extra levy. It's different from a from a from a towing tax, 
but it would be basically the idea would be you pay a uh, contribution to basically a reserve fund uh, when you bring this additional uh, uh, risk to the market. And so uh, this is not going to be given back uh, to you after the transaction is over. It is meant to basically generate additional capital reserves more actually in the market that could actually build up a war chest against big systemic losses. So it's, it's, it's not really a punishment for that. I think a punishment doesn't work very well here, but it would be more an incentive scheme of people appropriately, appropriately pricing the additional risk that they're funneling to the CCB and into the market. Okay. Okay. So there was a question on resolution, which uh, I would ask uh, to Anya. So that's Piera Copotelli who is saying, in your view, what is the most important difference between resolution framework uh, for of CCPs and resolution I mean, so framework? Of the banks? most important uh, difference is that we have now a very stable, uh, well, I mean, evolving, but at least it's in place, a framework for resolution of banks. We do not have yet a framework for CCPs. So this is a uh, um, apart from uh, that, those aspects which have already been uh, within uh, the CCP, so default uh, waterfall previously. Uh, but I mean, the question is also the very different function which these institutions uh, play. So the thinking about resolution and as Professor Copper alluded to, the question of resurrection is something completely different for an institution uh, uh, such as a CCP or an institution such as a bank, which is defined as a deposit taking inst um, institute. So there is a direct, let's say, public interest component to it as well in terms of concrete depositors. So I think this is a little bit the question of the different stakeholders involved, where the most important uh, difference is, to my mind, between the two institutions. Okay, uh, thanks. So it's it's uh, four o'clock. I think we could extend by four minutes, if you agree, until four or five. And I would like to give you the chance to both of you to have a look at uh, the questions and uh, pick a question that you'd like to, to answer. Uh, if we take those two questions, uh, I think we would be able to stay uh, on time. Good. It's, um, let me jump in here. I think there's a question about the CCP in the European uh, repo markets and the role of the ECB. Yep. Um, I'm not going to give a direct answer here. Um, I already alluded to you that I, it was, for me, very hard to understand why you introduce a CCP in repo markets. And I'm going to explain that in a second. And that answers your question to a certain degree. So I was involved in a discussion in Canada of introducing a CCP for the repo market. If you think about it, the repo market is already highly collateralized, what we're talking about here. And uh, if it's really a general collateral and a special collateral repo market uh, that's, that we are discussing here about with government securities backing it up, so you have a lot of already, uh, I think, um, risk management in place there. And to be frank with you, I think it was more motivated by technical default but uh, rather than outright default. Okay. But the issue here is that the, that the central bank, and it's very hard to understand, if there's a systemic problem in the repo market, it's the most central market funding market, and a central bank basically will automatically become the central counterparty in this market. Because if the repo market doesn't work on like overnight repo, the whole system's gonna break down. And the central bank for its monetary policy implementation needs to have this market in place. So if there's no transaction in the overnight market and in the repo market, even in the term market, the central bank has no other chance to come in and provide facilities. So from a systemic risk perspective, the only argument I could make is that, you know, it kind of levies the costs onto the financial market participants away from maybe the taxpayer because the central bank is going to come in. But that's the only reason. So. I think if there is if there's any issue with a central counterparty in the repo market, you're back to square one, and just you know as the white knight, the central bank is going to ride in and save the day. Okay, so there's not going to be any issue there whatsoever. This is in fact the problem of what the ECB can do in a crisis situation was one of the reasons why. Um, the amend why the, finally there was no amendment to the ECB statute. So because there has been there was a little bit of a 
in the design of the framework, there was a discussion of should uh, more competences go to super to the financial supervisors or to the ECB. Uh, finally, the legislators opted for a version which granted more uh, competences to the supervisors rather than uh, expanding the emergency powers of the central bank. As a result, um, the central, the, as far as I understand it, uh, the central bank uh, decided that it did not have the powers that it needed precisely for situ situations like this. So I think we will, we are also looking at a possible uh, crisis deferred into in the future in this area. So this is a fascinating area to study. Okay, thank you. Thorsten, concluding remarks? Yeah, no, I, I think that's an, that's an old question. I mean, um, the, the problem with central banks and financial market infrastructure is, 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 is a, a one of providing liquidity when it's necessary, apart from supervision. I think that's a big issue. And um, I, I don't know how the EU regulation involves in that, in that respect, but I think it's the, the elephant in the room. In a financial crisis, the CCP needs a lot of liquidity support because it might not get the liquidity support from its clearing members, from its, from its, from the corporate banks it deals with, and things like that. So I think this is a big issue of whether a CCP, for example, has access to central bank liquidity, and that depends on the exact framework. And I, I can't comment on that because I don't know the situation in, in Europe right now on this particular question. Maybe having asked uh, knows more about that, whether that's under discussion or there's a clear idea already. Thank you. Uh, thank you. So this seminar is about to, to end. I'd like to warmly thank uh, Tor and, and Agnieszka, our speakers, uh, for their time and dedication and all of you for your questions and, and comments. We couldn't address them all, uh, but I think there would be there would be other occasions. Um, if you're interested in, in CCPs, uh, come and attend the, the course we're going to have on 20 to 22 of May in Florence with uh, Professor Koppel and, and Agnieszka, amongst others.